Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of the uh, Didsbury Lectures. It's a real pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to deliver these lectures. And this year, on a topic that sadly never gets old-fashioned, evil. No matter how things shift on, no matter how human beings increase in number and wisdom, evil still digs around there. Yeah. And so at this time, a particular time of kind of dissonance and you know, deep concern across the world, thinking clearly about the issue of this evil, I think is really important. And so I hope to be able to help all of us together to, to think differently and clearly about the nature of evil. But welcome also to my office. So behind me here is my recording studio. So like I'm a aging wannabe rock star. And I will be, so just watch this space line. So back there is where I do my creative and imaginative stuff in terms of music and write lyrics and do all sorts of interesting things. And then down here uh, is where I do more formal theology, where I think about things, where I write and where I work and have conversations with people like your good selves. Uh, and so for me as a practical theologian, it's a good balance because I use one part of my brain back there I use another part of my brain down here, but actually when I'm thinking about theology, I'm using both. Theology has a rhythm, it has a music, it has a, a sense of poetics. I just like this space. I'm sorry if I sound too enthusiastic because I spend too much time in here. Um, anyway, just so you know the context, this background won't change very much as we go on. My shirt might, but I'm sure you can get used to it. We've all zoomed enough to be able to work out uh, the uh, complexities of uh, looking at things that are slightly off, but always interesting. All right, let's begin. So the presence of evil amongst us is a most perplexing phenomenon for both church and society. Why, if creation is deemed good, as in Genesis 1, is there so much evil and so much suffering. How are we to deal with that apparent contradiction? A few years ago, I wrote a book called Raging with Compassion, Pastoral Responses to the Problem of Evil was the subtitle. In it, I argued against philosophical theodic theodicy, you know, that attempt by people and philosophers, and sometimes by theologians, to explain the reasons why we have evil and suffering. And I argued that actually it's unexplainable. And sometimes when we try to explain it, things get even more confusing. You know, sometimes we turn, for example, to the book of Job. Now, if we think about Job as an explanation of evil, we be the book begins by saying that evil comes or suffering comes to Job because of God's gambling habits. That's not particularly helpful. If you have cancer and somebody says to you, well, it's the problem with your sin or the sin of somebody in your history. You just heap theological coals upon an already suffering person. If you lose a child and your pastor says to you, oh, it's actually all right. Your child is in the arms of Jesus and everything works for good uh, for those who love the Lord. That's not going to placate you. It's not going to help you. It's simply going to make you feel sad and unable to cope with the fact that actually there's a lack of goodness in the world and that everything may not simply work for good in that way. So it's complicated when we try to explain uh, the nature of evil. So I argued that we shouldn't try to do that. We should try to respond to the nature of evil or respond to the presence of evil through the practices that we engage in as Christians and as a church. So I argued that um, the problem of evil needs to be thought about as a problem of practice. So biblically, the, uh, the problem of evil is first and foremost a practical problem or a practical issue. It's things we resist, it's things we do, things God does to resist. So a major emphasis in Raging with Compassion was that the problem of evil was not simply the problem of suffering, important as that is, but the way in which evil interferes with and sometimes prevents human beings from loving God. Now, the problem of evil is often framed uh, as a problem of suffering. When this happens, suffering and evil become presumed to be the same thing. 
However, this way of thinking about suffering is relatively new and culturally bound. Historically, at different times across different cultures, suffering has simply been accepted as part of the way that the world is. People may complain about suffering, something that is prevalent in the Psalms of Lament and the Book of Job, and the Book of Lamentations, obviously. However, suffering was not inevitably considered to be an evil, but necessarily challenged people's faith and trust in God. So the psalmist complains about suffering, but his complaint is always aimed towards God. They, in, in the wealthy, western and highly medicalised cultures, suffering is assumed not to be the norm. It is considered a form of evil that directly challenges the reality and goodness of God. When this happens, the problem of evil and the problem of suffering become the same thing. So in my book, the earlier book, I try to tease out some of the issues by exploring the idea that not all suffering is in fact evil. If I have toothache, it's painful and it causes me suffering, but it doesn't represent an existential threat or provide a reason for me not believing in the goodness of God, although maybe it sometimes feels like anybody who's had a, a, a tooth infection knows what that feels like. But I argue that suffering becomes evil when it impacts upon our ability to love God and, the experiences, and experience God's love. So human suffering, pain and difficult circumstances are therefore not inherently evil. Rather, they can become evil when they function to block us from God's love. The task of the church, I said, is to utilise its God-given and spirit-filled practices in order to enable people to hold on to the love of God, even in the midst of suffering. So sitting at the heart of that book was the practice of contemplation, learning how to love God simply for God's sake, even in the midst of the wildest storms. This is the conclusion that Job came to after his trials and tribulations. And this is the dynamic that I tried to capture in that book in relation to how we should respond to evil. So the task of the church is to help facilitate and sustain love by engaging in actions which mirror, participate in, attest, and are a vehicle for God's redemptive movement within history. And that movement, of course, is focused on the death and the resurrection of Jesus, which we'll come back to again and again here. So the Christian practices highlighted were lament, forgiveness, thoughtfulness, hospitality, and friendship. Each in different ways functions as a practice of resistance that enables us to move closer to God even in the midst of evil and suffering. That's all good and well. And I still stand by the arguments in that book. However, having listened to those who have affirmed and critiqued it, I recognise that there is more to be said. One recent uh, critique that I found particularly helpful was by my friend and colleague uh, Ben Fulford. Ben's a systematic theologian at, uh, in Chester, and in a recent online paper titled Practices of Compassion and Resistance, he makes a very important observation and critique of my work in Raging with Compassion. He generally agrees with the emphasis on developing practices of resistance that manifest the love and compassion of God in important ways, uh, important ways of resisting evil. However, he suggests that there is more to the story of evil and resisting evil than can be found in simply focusing on evil's ability to interfere with our experiences of the love of God. Fulford puts the issue this way, and let me just quote him. Swinton's vision is a bit too ecclesiocentric or overly church-focused in its diagnosis of evil and its practical theodicy of addressing it. The threat posed by evil to our love of God is indeed real and unsurpassed in seriousness. But evil threatens other dimensions of our creaturely existence as well, with other relations uh, integral to the love of God and the goods internal to them. Uh, a bit more of doctrine of creation would help here. And of course, Christian practices do not automatically shape good character, nor are they often innocent of deformation. And I think that are really helpful. My focus had been 
on personal and communal formation, that the uh, forms of formation that enable the sustenance of human beings' ability to love God in the midst of evil. But of course, there are wider dimensions to evil that include, that, 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 that include, but are certainly not fully defined by the perspective I developed. Fulford is right that evil threatens other aspects of our creaturely existence, which are integral to the love of God. He is also correct that a focus on the doctrine of creation opens up space for a wider exploration of evil and perhaps a broader set of practices of resistance. And of course, and this is really important, we'll see this as we move on, Christian practices have the potential to shape and form people for good, but they can become deformed or they can make no difference to somebody's life. So we need to think that through as we go on. We may have practices that help us to resist, but we have to engage with them in ways that are filled with integrity and possibility. As Eric Stoddart has put it, every practice within and beyond the ministries of care, Christian caring organised by the church can be explored theologically. So there's political dimensions to that theology, sociological dimensions uh, and ecclesiological dimensions. These are not separate, but my emphasis clearly had been on the ecclesial and not necessarily enough on this other dimension. So the church and its theology has a responsibility, as Fulford implies, to shape people and society more widely. Uh, this suggestion, which I think is a good one, frames the argument which follows. So I'm, I'm, I'm not answering that, but I'm using that concept to frame what it is I want to say. So as I was thinking of through uh, Fulford's comments, something else happened that pulled me up short. I was praying the Lord's Prayer when I noticed something that I hadn't thought about before. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It was that last line that jumped out at me. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What does that actually mean? Temptation is central to being drawn into sin and evil. We just need to look at the temptations of Jesus to see the way that human beings can be tempted by power, control, control godlessness, false autonomy. However, when we turn to the book of James, he is very clear that God does not lead us into temptation. James informs us, and remember when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. The one who cannot be tempted helps us to avoid the temptation, is what James is really saying to us. So avoiding temptation then is something that humans do when we turn to God and do not yield to our creaturely desires. We can choose to yield to temptation, or we can choose to be led into temptation by the columns of the out, led out of temptation by the columns of the spirit. Yielding or not yielding is something that we do with our bodies with our hearts and with our minds. So as we engage in the spiritual practices of prayer, Bible reading, contemplation, worship and so forth, we are shaped and formed in ways that help us not to yield to temptation. In the case of temptation, we have at least some degree of choice over it. However, Jesus follows that up immediately by emphasising that we need to be delivered from evil. We can be led into and out of temptation, but we need to be delivered from evil. Deliverance indicates that there is something about evil that is not only to do with weak human will and decision making. Leading us out of temptation and delivering us from evil are clearly connected, but they seem to not to be precisely the same thing. Now, in my previous work, I tended to focus on using Christian practices to avoid temptation and to be led out of temptation. However, the issue of deliverance, that which only God can do, had perhaps not effectively been related upon. Within these, with these thoughts and minds, I, I turn to Paul's reflections in the letter of Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 10, where he talks about being strong in the Lord, putting on the armour of faith, faith, putting on the spiritual, uh, taking the spiritual gifts and using them to protect yourself. 
And it's, you know, it's very clear, Paul says, we're equipped to put on the armour of faith as we engage in spiritual practices and walk with Jesus through the spirit-filled life of discipleship. In so de- doing, we at least have the possibility of avoiding temptation. So when we put on the armour of faith, when we do all these things, we have at least the possibility of avoiding temptation because we see the world differently when we see the, the temptations of the world uh, clearly. However, there's only so much that human beings can do as human beings to resist evil. There are powers beyond us over which we have no control. These powers transcend mere temptation. They are the source of the temptations that we are told to resist. These powers are not irresistible, but they're wily and very tempting. God has control over them. Crucially, the powers have been defeated in and through the cross of Jesus. There's an ongoing battle, but it has been won. That, of course, doesn't necessarily make our lives easier for the moment, but it does remind us that resistance requires the ongoing intervention of God to do the things that only God can do to deliver us. So in order to be not to be sucked into the dark vortex of evil, we need to be alert, informed, prayerful, and always aware of the need to be attentive to the urgings of the Spirit. Ultimately, only God can deliver us from that power which is evil. So the power to resist evil is both within us and beyond us. If we are to resist evil, we need to engage with strategies and tactics that will take seriously both temptation and deliverance, deliverance, that which we can do, that which God does. So when I was invited to do the Disbury lectures, I thought it's a good opportunity to begin to tease out some of these things and look at the question, what does evil do? So I don't want to focus in these lectures on the explanation for evil, why it exists, etc. I think that's an unanswerable question. But focusing on what evil does and enabling us to see evil clearly in the world opens up the possibility that we can resist temptation and we're open to follow God into his deliverance. So, with that as background, uh, let's begin to, to dig into the issues. So, it would helpful to begin by asking the basic question, what is it exactly do we mean when we're talking about evil? In developing a provisional perspective on evil, it would be helpful to take Fulford's advice and begin with the doctrine of creation, or more specifically, the doctrine of creation out of nothing. The systematic theologian Ian McFarlane points out that there are two dimensions of the creation story that relate directly to our understanding of evil. God created the world out of nothing, and he said it was good. The fact that the world was created out of nothing rather than something is crucial. Creation from nothing means that God is the sole condition of the world's existence in every aspect and at every moment. So there's no room here for a Manichaean form of dualism which sees evil as a negative force or power that's equal to God. There's only one creative force and it is wholly good, God. Evil is certainly a reality, but it's a negative reality that emerges after God proclaims creation as as good. It's therefore not a product of God's good creative intentions. Evil is by definition that which God does not desire. So McFarlane names evil as that which is against God's will. It's a negative force that pushes into and against the goodness of creation. It's not, however, an independent force. Evil comes from within creation for whatever mysterious reason. It's not independent. It's a distortion of God's goodness. Evil is something that comes from within creation. So within creation, each creature has a place that is ascribed to it by God. The goodness of God is manifested in God's desire for God's creatures to flourish, that is, to achieve ways of living within creation that are in line with their God-given nature. Put slightly differently, God desires God's creatures to flourish according to their nature. Evil is that which threatens 
or inhibits creatures flourishing as the beings God intended them to be. If the, mean, if the meaning of human flourishing is to love God, self, and neighbor, as Jesus suggests, evil is all that stands against such love. Evil seeks to distract and destroy the true source of human flourishing. It tempts people to look at and to the world in ways that avoid and distort God and avoid and distort relationships between human beings. Evil lurks within such things as false perceptions, stereotypes, cultural blindness, dehumanizing misidentifications such as racism, sexism, disabledism, xenophobia. The presence and acknowledgments of the love of God and the presence of human flourishing are two indicators that evil is being resisted. When these things are absent, we know that evil is either with us or evil is on its way. Now we may ask, why does evil exist? And I've already suggested that you know, there, there isn't an answer to that question. So creation out of nothing emphasizes that evil is not God's intention, because God is good. It is certainly the case that God seems to permit evil, something that is both mysterious and deeply uh, frustrating. As to why evil exists, we're, we're left with a mystery. Matthew's parable of the weeds does, however, give us a clue, if not an answer. So in Matthew 13, we find this passage. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, don't you, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the wheat come from? The answer was this. An enemy did this, he replied. An enemy did this. I find that really chilling. It reminds me of the point in a Stephen King novel when you suddenly begin to realise that what you thought was going on is quite different from what is actually going on. There's a malignant presence that you hadn't accounted for, and it's already here. Precisely who or what the enemy is is not stated. What is clear, however, is that there seems to be a force at work within creation that is out of kilter with God's good plan and which seeks to sow the seeds of human destruction. That force is active in the midst of the world. It is, however, a beaten force. The parable continues. The servants asked him, do you want to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weed up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. So the idea that evil is interspersed with good seed is empirically obvious, we can see it everywhere, but nonetheless important. Resisting evil requires that we develop the skills to discern evil in the midst of apparent normality of our everyday lives. Without that discernment, we risk harming the innocent. There's no justification for collateral damage in the Gospels. Fighting evil is subtle, careful, thoughtful, aware, but no less powerful in its sensitivity. Wherever there's good, there's probably also evil. Working out which is which can be difficult, but one of the things that we want to do in these four lectures is begin to think about how we work out which is which, how we work out good from evil, and sometimes we think that good things are evil things. How do we do that? What's that process of discernment, discernment that lets us see the world? That's our task uh, for the next few days. So the fact that the enemy will be with us until Jesus returns does not mean that we have to live at peace with evil. Knowledge of Jesus' victory is not a manifesto for complacency. We don't just let child abuse go uh, undetected and unpunished in the hope that all will be well in the end. 
To do such a thing would itself be a mode of evil. We are called to be aware of the presence of evil and to resist the enemy at all times. Ignoring evil is a way of committing evil. And that will become really clear as we, as we move on. So this, to summarise this, this section. In summary, cre creation out of nothing informs us of the following things. Firstly, God created the world and declared it good. It is good, but somehow broken. God did not create evil, nor does God intend evil for God's creatures. Evil is not an aspect of God's being. God is a good and loving God. Every good and perfect gift is from above, uh, as John puts it. Evil is not an illusion. God is not powerless against evil, but for reasons that are hidden from us, he chooses not to fully destroy it at the moment. God is active in the world through human beings and through spiritual deliverance to bring about God's desired end. Evil will ultimately be defeated by God in the final judgment. For now, Christians are called to look out for and to resist evil, to see evil. So having laid down that uh, foundational perspective on evil. I want to th kind of thicken that account now by turning to um, New Testament scholar Susan Eastman and her exegesis of Romans, uh, first seven books of Romans, and how Paul talks about evil and how Paul talks about sin. So evil and sin in Paul. One of the big problems for the world just now is the issue of truth. We live in a world where fake news and lie-telling have become normalised within the political arena. A world where the internet has provided us with a lot of information but not necessarily any knowledge or wisdom. In a world where powerful people try to persuade us that we are living in a post-truth age, working out what is and what is not true can be challenging to say the least. And of course that kind of communicational moral dissonance is a breeding place for evil. So in her essay, The Empire of Illusion, Sin, Evil and Good, Good News in Romans, Susan Eastman points out that in Romans, Paul lays out clearly what the nature of evil and sin look like. For Paul, evil and sin are things that people do and forces and forces that lie behind things and behind and beyond things that people do. So, evil and sin involves human actions within certain cause, causal explanations, but uh, it also st uh, stretches beyond human actions. So, for example, uh, in the Rwandan genocide, where we, which we will look at in lecture number three, clearly there were political forces, clearly there were human beings doing certain things, and clearly there was, there was a very material basis to it. But when we reflect theologically on that situation, it's clear there are dark forces that lie behind that. So there's a material dimension to evil and sin, but behind that, there's the forces uh, that are, exceed human weaknesses. So importantly, evil is both explainable, because you can see some of the reasons why things happen, and, in this, uh, and unexplainable. It's also resistible, because we don't have to yield to temptation, and irresistible because there are certain forces and powers that we just can't resist, and that's God's deliverance is, is necessary there. So a concern for Eastman, as for others, is that the language of evil is losing its power within contemporary society. Other less powerful explanations of what traditionally has been called sin and evil have emerged from disciplines such as psychology, psychiatry, sociology. These explanations have provided us with a language that explains what might otherwise be described as evil. The problem is that such explanations locate the source of evil solely within the self. They deal effectively with one dimension of the problem, what people do, but in reducing evil to that dimension, they prevent us from seeing the wider spiritual dimensions. The problem here is that when the source of evil is located solely within the self, it's all too easy to see it only in our enemies. When we begin to see evil in those who oppose us and never in ourselves, 
all sorts of unpleasant things begin to happen, as we'll see as these lectures unfold. So part of Eastman's task is to challenge the idea that evil is located solely within the self and to offer a broader theological framework that helps us to see evil for what it is, personal, communal, and suprapersonal, something that goes beyond the personal. So evil is something that people does do, does do. Eastman points out that for Paul, the primary problem for human beings lies in their failure to acknowledge God, to name God as God, and to accept that God cannot be reduced to the self. This basic truth is fundamental for an accurate reading of the world. Failure to grasp this reality leads to serious cognitive and perceptual difficulties. If we cannot see the world clearly, we cannot live and act faithfully within it. We end up living in what Chris Hedges has called the empire of illusion. It's impossible to escape from the empire of illusion because by definition it's illusory. We can't see it. Eastman argues that unveiling this illusion and offering a way of properly seeing the world and everything within it is fundamental to Paul's understanding of sin and evil and how to resist it, as he lays it out in the early chapters of Romans. This is at least a significant part of what Paul means when in Romans 12, 2, he tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For Paul, Sin and evil are interconnected, but they're not necessarily synonymous. In the first three chapters of Romans, Paul emphasizes that evil is something that human beings do. So humans are depicted as having been handed over to God, to an, uh, handed over by God to an unreasoning mind, an improper conduct precisely because they, they didn't see fit to acknowledge God. So their minds were distorted. So Paul's picture of evil and evil doing relates to the enmeshment of human beings in webs of falsehood and violence, accompanied by a corresponding suppression of human cap capacities for perception and cognition. So you can see this in Romans uh, 12, 12 to 25. Let me read this passage to you. Paul says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore they uh, gave themselves over in the sinful, the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. This is the key point. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is ever to be praised. Amen. So Eastman draws out the, 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 a point that's very important for our understanding of what evil does. She says this. She says the cognitive and perceptual impairment uh, has important implications. It means that the difference between truth and falsehood is not located in intentions of individuals, but in the difference between an accurate stroke truthful or distorted, distorted stroke false orientation to the fundamental reality of God's creation and rule in the cosmos. Deception thus goes deeper than consciously false speed, speech. It concerns rather the idolatry that creates and maintains an alternative counterfeit personal reality. In other words, you don't have to be uh, intentional about being evil. You can just not see the evil around you because your cognitive thinking is distorted. And so you can be looking at evil, not actually noticing it. So to be evil is not simply in to do with intentionality. It can very often to be with to do with distorted thinking. So you don't have to intend to be evil, to do evil. You just need to lose your sense of truth and falsehood and allow yourself to become cognitively dislocated and disoriented from the fundamental reality that is God. 
So when we talk, start to talk about the only truth being my truth, or the, that truth is flexible, and anyway, you know, uh, wh who knows what is true, we take the first steps towards being drawn to it, away from the truth of God and towards evil. So in drawing out uh, Eastman's point, which I think is a really important point, I mean, think about it to yourself, like, you may be deeply immersed just now in evil and not even notice it. So in drawing out uh, uh, Eastman's point, um, It'll be helpful to uh, spend a little time with the German philosopher, Hannah Arendt, and her idea of the banality of evil. So in her earlier work on totalitarianism, Arendt had explored the concept of what she called radical evil, and we'll come back to that in a, in a, le a later uh, lecture, arguing that horrendous evils such as those perpetrated in Auschwitz were fundamentally unexplainable. Such evil, she says, is dark, demonic, unimaginable. It's more than just dehumanisation. The radically evil practices that occurred within Auschwitz and other prison camps were designed to do away with the very concept of humanity. She concluded that such evil was beyond human explanation and language. But then something happened for her. Aaron began to change her position on the inexplicability of evil as she watched the trial of Otto Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. Now Eichmann was a German-Austrian and one of the major organisers of the Holocaust. Uh, during World War II, Eichmann was tasked with the f the f was facilitating and managing the logistics involved in the mass deportation of Jews to ghettos and extermination camps in Nazi-occupied uh, Europe. He was a great administrator in that sense. After the war, he, es he escaped to Argentina, but was captured by the Isra Israeli Mossad in May 1960. He was taken out of the country and put on trial in Jerusalem. He was later convicted and hanged in 1962. Now, uh, Arndt had been sent by the New Yorker to report on the trial, along with, uh, say, along with a series of articles that came out of that. She also had a very interesting but highly controversial book titled Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. And it's that subtitle about the banality of evil that caused so much controversy and caused her so much personal distress. So prior to the trial, I aren't expected Eichmann to be an a moral monster. However, as she sat in the courtroom and watched him over the course of the trial, she was surprised. He was not the moral monster she assumed him to be, to be he would be. He was a bureaucrat, interested in keeping the system he was responsible for running effectively. A man, a clown, as he described him, who seemed only to be able to speak in cliches. Eichmann certainly facilitated deeds that were radically evil, and as she would argue later, completely unforgivable. However, he did so, she suggested, without evil intention. He was an organiser, meticulous in planning the times and places for trains to move and for people to be relocated. But, at least so Arendt thought, he wasn't particularly rabid about the Nazi cause. Of course, documents have come to the fore since then to suggest that's not the case. But the idea of the banality of evil remains significant. He was more interested in, in doing his job well and progressing up the, key, the career ladder. She suggested that Eichmann's evil deeds were tired not to evil intent, but to thoughtlessness, an inability to think from the standpoint of other people. She didn't mean that he was stupid, he was simply lacking in judgment, lacking in discernment, lacking the particular cognitive ability uh, uh, that was necessary to uh, make good judgment. He committed crimes under circumstances that made it well nigh impossible for him to know or to feel that he was doing something wrong. I haven't described the, the kind of character that she uh, saw in Eichmann as a uh, as the banality of evil, like the everydayness of evil. Just the small things that he did just ended up with horrendous consequences. He was shallow, thoughtless, unempathetic, 
uh, and above all, lacking almost completely in judgment. This was not intended to belittle his crimes. Arndt's intentions were simply to point out that in this case, tremendous evil was explainable and tied to a failure to recognise that banal actions can have deeply evil consequences. So if we return to Eastman's analysis of Paul, Arndt's observation seems to be a non-religious way of getting at what Paul's pushing to, into in his description of evil in Romans. You don't have to intend to be evil to be complicit in evil. Eastman puts it this way. People consciously lie and people also unconsciously act out of the, out the implications of living in a lie. This too for Paul is evil. That's the common excuses such as I didn't mean to do it or well, that's what I said but I didn't mean it or I didn't know what I was doing are simply irrelevant to questions of human culpability and divine judgment. Intentions are slippery, if not impossible, to pin down. That's quite a terrifying thought that you can be implicit in evil and sometimes radical evil and not even know it. Eichmann's Cognition and vision had become distorted as he thoughtlessly gave himself over to the demonically warped description of the world that emerged from engagement with Nazi ideology. His failure to acknowledge God, name God as God, and accept that God cannot be reduced to the self had disastrous consequences. So the tight connection between distorted cognition, false speech, and evil acts led to a situation where signing forms and shuffling pieces of paper resulted in the deaths of millions of people. The power of a signature. It's terrifying. So Aaron's idea of the banality of evil reminds us that evil can be explainable, sometimes in terms of simple, thoughtless actions. She reminds us that evil actions are not necessarily intentional, you can't accidentally commit genocide, but you can unintentionally contribute to its occurrence. And we'll see that very clearly in lecture number three, when we talk specifically about the issue of genocide. So we might want to pause for a moment and consider what, for example, it means that the, the designer trainer shoes or the cheap shirt that you're, or the jacket you're wearing just now, or the pajamas you're wearing just now, wherever you are, uh, that you might decide to purchase on the high street may be made by children who live in deep poverty and are paid next to nothing for producing them. And it may be that the things that you buy, the way you buy them, the reasons you buy them for, actually cause child poverty. A swipe of the credit card feeds the market within which the evil of child poverty flourishes. And that's before we even consider the background to our phones, where they're made, how they're made, what the conditions of the people that make it, and so on and so forth. The world, and ultimately God, will judge us by our actions, not by our intentions. So be careful what you do with your credit card. So the banality of evil names certain aspects of uh, evil, but not the whole. Evil is, uh, at one level, explainable in that way, but at another level, it's completely unexplainable. Eastman notes a, a, an important shift in Romans. Following his description of evil in verses 1 to 3, evil drops out of Paul's writing until we get to chapter 7, where it returns. But this time it's tied in with sin and once again with deception. However, there's an important shift in the understanding of sin and evil. Evil is no longer simply something that people do. Now, in 7, 19-21, for example, evil is tied in with sin, and what sin does counter to the wishes of the self. Sin now performs the action previously ascribed uh, solely to human beings. Evil has become extended and externalised. From there on in, sin is seen as an active force that is vigorously challenged, to be vigorously challenged and avoided. Sin is not only the opposite of loving service to God and others. Now it seems that it's a, it seems a force that actively attempts to move people away from God. 
Sin is a power in that sense. It's a force. An enemy did this. So Romans ends with a striking statement about God's victory over sin. Um, Paul says this, I would have... Uh, I would have you wise as to what good and guileless as to what is evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Wisdom enables us to yield to temptation. God delivers us from the power of evil. We will return to that dimension a little bit later. So the, 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 point, the, the point I always have in mind here is that there are forces from outside and forces from inside that end up causing the thing that we encountered experience in the name is evil. Uh, so in conclusion, we have seen that there are two different narratives of the relationship of human beings with sin and evil uh, in Romans. In the first, human beings are culpable sinners in need of forgiveness and redemption. Uh, that we really need deliverance from the... Uh, well, Sorry, we need, let, me, let me do that again. In the first, human beings are culpable sinners in need of forgiveness and redemption. Uh, and this consists of deliverance from the justly deserved punishment from God, which is where we find comes from Christ. Here, human beings have in principle the cognitive capacity to change and not to yield to temptation. They do this in conjunction with the spirit, but there is a meaningful kind of bodily participation in moving away from these temptations and towards the desires of God. Uh, our failures here are covered by the blood of Jesus. In the second narrative of sin and evil, human beings are enslaved and deceived by sin, with sin perceived as a hostile power that co-ops even the best human endeavours. So redemption here consists of God's active deliverance from the enslaving powers through union with Christ. So to sum up the second part of the paper and to get us moving towards what we're going to be doing in the second uh, lecture, uh, three points. Evil is something that people do. It's a choice rather than an inevitability. However, it's possible to do evil without intending to choose to do evil. Good judgment and thoughtfulness are therefore primary tools of resistance to the banality of evil. Secondly, sin is a power that seeks to destroy human flourishing. Where sin is, evil will be there as well. Sin is a power that actively seeks to prevent humans from attaining their true heart's desire to love God and to love others. As such, sin and evil require spiritual understanding and intervention, as well as political, social and psychological responses. Resisting evil, as we'll see, is embodied spiritual warfare. Thirdly, evil is not irresistible. The power evil has over human beings is to tempt them, to distract them from doing what is right, but it can be resisted by putting on the armour of faith and ultimately it will be defeated through the blood of Jesus. What we have done today is to begin to discern what evil is and importantly, what evil does, it deceives us. In our next lecture, we'll turn to the issue of how we uncover uh, evil and how we respond to that. And our focus in the lecture will be specifically on the evils that are emerging from the current pandemic. So in this lecture, we are kind of theoretical framework that begins to help us to understand what evil is, what evil does. Tomorrow, we begin to say, well, what does that look like? And what does that look like in a time of pandemic? So I look forward to talking with you then.